Good morning, everyone. Thanks for all showing up. I'd like to promise that I'll always be here for the 8 a.m. talks from now on as reciprocation, but I really don't want to break a promise, so I'm not going to promise that, but thank you for showing up. Today I'm going to talk about uh, our annual fish, uh, forage fish surveys that we do on Lake Superior, our nearshore and our offshore survey, and then based on kind of the theme of the Superior theme, especially from yesterday, I'm also going to spend some time talking about the work we're doing with Cisco, some new stuff. So last year, if you remember, that was the big ice year, and everyone was so excited about how much ice uh, the Great Lakes got, either excited because it's something new as scientists, so it gave us some, some end points to, uh, to, do, to compare our work to, are just sick of the whole winter that lasted so long. And again, in this year, we had actually similar percent ice cover on Lake Superior, but didn't get half the news that uh, we had before. And this ice, uh, we thought it was going to cause lots of problems. So this is the, like the first day of our survey. It started off with a pretty ominous feel to it, where we left Ashland, we're coming out of Shawamigan Bay, we make a right turn to go over towards Michigan Island, do some samples, blocked by ice. So we said, okay, we'll just go around to the left side of Madeline Island, blocked, come back. So if you look uh, the, on that little table that's on the right, that, that shows up on, the, on our plotter program on our ship. And the RTG is, uh, or the TTG, is time to get there. Never. So we never. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we were never going to finish this survey. <laughs> In actuality, it turned out fine. That was the only day that we couldn't do work. Uh, so our, our timing was right where it should have been for both our nearshore and our offshore surveys. Uh, the middle of May to the middle of June for nearshore, and then July for offshore. We did 73 sites on our nearshore survey, uh, and that was a little bit less. Our plan is usually around 82 to 84, and a lot of times we can't get to some sites because of commercial fishing nets, and that, they were really abundant this year. The price of whitefish is way up, as you all know, and so there was lots of fishing activity, so quite a few of our sites we couldn't fish because there were commercial fishing nets in front of them. And we also had some mechanical problems with the ship where we couldn't do some of the surveys. Uh, so the dots on the map here are our nearshore survey sites, for those who are not familiar with it, that ring of pearls. And so they're systematically arranged around the lake. And then those squares are our offshore survey. And all that ice caused very cold water temperatures. Uh, so that's very cold in the two and a half to, to three degree range from the surface all the way to the bottom. So that was throughout the survey. And for comparison, uh, the yellow is the long-term mean for our survey of what those sites at that time of year should look like. And then, and then 2012 was that really warm year and see how warm it was then. And so that's only a two-year difference between 2012, the warmest year on record, and now uh, 2014, the coldest year on record. So big change uh, in the fish neighborhood there on Lake Superior. <coughs> this shows fish collections over time, just a, a peek at the number of species that we get, a look at biodiversity and a comparison of native species to introduced species and uh, in invasive species. The only introduced species that we caught, we caught one hatchery lake trout. <clears throat> we didn't catch any of the others that we, any of the Pacific salmons, and we'll sometimes catch a few of those, or a splake, we didn't catch any this year. And then uh, for invasives, we caught all of those except for three spine stickleback. We didn't catch any of those this year. And native species were a little bit, a uh, little bit up from previous years. So it, it was, it was really cold, but we caught our normal, pretty much our normal composition of fish. This looks at total. So if you add up all the different species, the total biomass, and this is kind of our, our, our one standard metric of total forage fish biomass over time, and it was up a little bit from, uh, from 2013 and a little bit below the long-term mean, but not much. This is the median. Uh, there's a lot of variability, and I talked about that last year, and I had some slides in there this year to go over that again, but then with the Cisco stuff, I replaced those yesterday to talk about the Cisco stuff instead of talking about the variability. Uh, but if you look at the median, uh, it, was, it was also up, uh, and it shows a similar pattern. Another way to look is this, the median and the mean track one another. And the median value is, is about 30% of the mean. And we think of this 
our forage fist as an index rather than an absolute number. But if we're thinking about how we're going to use these numbers to populate an ecosystem model, um, it's one of the discussions we're having right now. Should we be using mean values or median values uh, for those absolute values that you have to put into the model? And that orange dot on the bottom plot is where we were this year, so the mean and the median matched. In terms of who were winners, in the sense that there are winners, or who we caught a lot of and who we didn't catch much of, Lake Whitefish was the big winner this, this past year. Uh, and lake trout, uh, both Cisquet and Leans, were either similar or up a little bit from the long-term mean. And that long-term mean is based on the, the average mean value uh, for biomass from 78 to 2014. And everything else was down. And the things that were down the most uh, were those corrigonids. So Cisco, bloater, uh, short jaws in there as well, uh, round whitefish, those are captured in other, but they were all way down below the long-term mean. And this is the same story we've been saying five, maybe 10 years now. And we're just getting, that disparity is just getting a little bit greater each year because we're not having a recruitment events. Uh, Lake Whitefish uh, was the big winner, uh, so they were up quite a bit, and a, a huge difference from what we saw between 2009 and 2012. Recruitment of Lake Whitefish, so these are one-year-old fish, so that were young of the year the previous, uh, the previous year, so they were spawning from that winter of 2012-2013 that we would then pick up as one-year-olds in 2014. So a lot of that biomass was not driven by new recruits of Lake Whitefish. It was more of two, three, four-year-old fish. But there was a, there was a, wide, uh, a wide variety of sizes that we caught. So it wasn't dominated by a few large fish, it was, but not a lot of one-year-olds. The recruitment was, was, was down a little bit, uh, but again, the overall biomass was up. Lake trout, and I slid this slide in, uh, in response to the, to the talk that we heard yesterday about uh, the loss of genetic variation. And this, what this shows is, uh, in the top it shows biomass of lake trout, and so that, that went up a little bit the last couple years. But what's more interesting, if we look at who we're catching, so these are the same sites sampled from 1978 to 2014, the same depths are sampled, and if you look at the, the number of Siskoet that are now moving it's like a consistent progression of Siskiyou that are moving into these nearshore areas. And I thought that fit really well with that talk we heard yesterday about uh, the relationship between, or the, the lack of separation in Siskiyou and Leans. And maybe this is kind of playing out now in terms of habitat choices, where there's this homogenization of the two, the two morphotypes. And then a, a complete loss of hatchery lake trout, which is expected because there isn't any more uh, stocking going on. Our offshore survey, uh, this is done in July, and those are the squares in the middle of that, that map. And those, we've been doing this since 2012. And these are all randomly picked uh, with a little bit of uh, depth put in for classification. Otherwise, if we didn't do that, they'd all occur probably in depths greater than 200 meters, which is very interesting. Uh, so these are all, these, these sites are from 100 meters to 300 and something meters meters deep, so the deep parts of Lake Superior, which is most of Lake Superior. And it's a much more simpler community in terms of what we catch there, and it's dominated by deep water sculpin, Kai and Siskiyou Lake Trout. Again, very cold there, that, that same temperature plot that I showed for nearshore, this is that plot for offshore. Uh, pie diagrams for, the, for those three major, three major species, and then a group of, of other species, and the others are uh, short jaws and bloaters primarily, but not very many of those. One thing you, you'll see here is that just the consistency and the size of the pies. So uh, most of the samples are pretty similar to one another. We don't see a huge difference in biomass that we see when we sample in nearshore areas. The trend for this, uh, for this offshore uh, survey and this again we've been doing it since 2011 only uh, not a lot of change down a little bit and I think a lot of that uh, difference why it's down a little bit is because of the mechanical problems we had and a few other issues on that survey we weren't able to sample some of the sites that we had sampled before I think we were down 
like four sites from what we had planned to sample that we were able to sample. And those sites have always been real high biomass in the past. And so I think that's why it's down. It's not so much a reflection of what's in the lake. It was our ability to, to catch fish in the lake. If we look at the difference between nearshore and offshore, uh, so just comparing those those two surveys, and again, these are these are benthic fish. We see that uh, they're getting closer and closer, at least over the last four years, into uh, the total magnitude of biomass between nearshore and offshore areas. Another way to look at this, though, if we look at the median, that's not that's not true at all. So again, which is the better? value that we should be reporting uh, or which value that, that we should be using. I think this is more accurate reflection of what we see in terms of a total lake-wide picture, just to look at the median rather than the mean. And just for comparison, I always feel better about my salary if I look at the median salary than if I look at the mean salary. <laughs> Cisco recruitment, that, was, uh, that underlies a lot of what we talked about yesterday and the lack of Cisco recruitment. And if you work for the USGS, you're proud to see this. That was shown probably four times yesterday. And maybe you who don't work for the USGS are sick of seeing this plot. But we feel really good about our ability to index those, those, young, those young Cisco uh, in Lake Superior. But again, there's, we, we haven't had a recruitment event for a long time. So why the lack of recruitment of Cisco? Uh, if you had to pick, you know, you write down on a back of an envelope what that would be. It would be, are they being eaten? Are they starving? Or is it some environmental change that's affecting uh, some of the upper two? And I'm not going to talk about the upper two, but I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental changes and how that may be affecting Cisco recruitment and how, what the, the steps that we're taking to try to figure that out. So a changing ecosystem, less ice cover uh, equals warmer water. And they're about 2007. You know, that's when the, the papers came out from Jay Austin that talked about Lake Superior warming and a decline in, in ice. And it was, and they showed a, a nice linear trend. But if, since that time now, almost eight years since then, uh, it's not a linear trend. The trend is not linear at all anymore. There's been more of a, uh, just a change. And so, and that change occurred in 1998. So that upper left hand plot uh, shows that quite well of how we've seen a change in, in the amount of ice since then. And, and then that is reflected then in a change in temperature. So if you look at the plots on the right, that's it goes surface uh, 10 meters below, 50 meters below, and 100 meters below uh, versus uh, percent ice cover on the x-axis. And that all makes sense, right? If we have more ice in the spring, the water's going to be cooled. If we make a drink at home, right, you put more ice in it, and it's going to cool it down. Uh, and then the plot, of, plot on the bottom left is, what that ice does then, it reflects how, how quick the lake warms up. And so it, right now the lake is warming up much quicker than it was prior to 1998. So what's the relationship between Cisco recruitment and ice cover? Like all things in ecology and fisheries management, it's not simple, right? And we're very proud of this long 40-some year history, data uh, collection history that we have, but it's really not long enough when, you, when you're trying to figure out what's happening with a, with a fish that has sporadic recruitment, even if you didn't have any environmental change going on. So basically, I think we have seven successful recruitment events over the lifetime of our surveys from 1978. And in general, it looks like if, you, if we have less than 60, 70 percent ice cover, we're not getting any recruitment at all. But a lot of years we have high ice cover and we're not getting any recruitment at all. So this past year when we had all that ice cover, uh, we put a lot of thought into how can we take advantage of that because this may be, if we're thinking about there, there is, a, there is a, a major shift going on in the environment, this may be the last time that we have to to look at what happens in a, in a real high ice year, a real cold spring. Uh, so we thought of different things that we should be collecting during our, during our survey. And one of the things we came up with was to try to collect uh, larval fish at the, at the surface during those spring surveys. So what we did is we pulled these two nets, and they're each one square meter, and we pulled those for 10 minutes at the same time we were bottom trawling. 
So all the sites that we bottom trawl, basically 100 sites, uh, we did the surface trawling at the same time. And this is what we caught. We caught a lot of small chlorogonids. This shows all the sites that we sampled with that surface trawl. Uh, this is what they look like at, at that age, very small. Start out about eight to nine millimeters uh, when we started the survey in May. At 95 locations, you sum them all up for, to calculate a, an average number across the lake, uh, 14 billion plus or minus 30 million, which sounds like a lot, but that's really small confidences. It was pretty tight. There was, there was, you see quite a bit of difference in the size of those, those dots, and there's huge differences what each one of those dots represents. But by the time we had done 95 sites, we weren't, it wasn't changing the mean value across the lake, lake at all. Uh, and about 600 per hectare, which is pretty, if all those fish were to survive, I'm not gonna go back and show you that our beautiful plot of our recruitment index, but the highest value there is 800, and if it's above 100, that's, we consider that a good recruitment year. And so at, at this stage, they were, they were at 600. But we know most of these are probably not going to survive. Also on this map is a current map uh, that was from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Just thinking about, uh, we know where the prime spawning areas are. We know that they're at the surface. They're not strong swimmers. They're going to get moved around by wind and the currents that, that occur around the lake. And the ship is always moving too. So the beautiful thing is we get a lake-wide picture but the ship is always moving, so we're not sampling the, the same individuals over time or the same little subpopulation over time. We're sampling different populations over time. Uh, but we caught them just about everywhere, which was surprising. Like We had thought that we wouldn't catch any offshore, and we, at some of these sites we caught a lot offshore. And the current map, you can kind of make believe that it works <laughs> at, some of your, at some sites, but other sites where you, you see us uh, a strong convergence of currents, you know, we, we saw really low populations. But again, that's maybe an issue just of when we were sampling, because we started sampling in mid-May, and we kept sampling until July. This is to look at growth. So this is the growth of those individuals that, that, that we are collecting throughout, throughout the summer. So starting uh, in May for the Nearshore Survey and going to June 20th. And so when they first came out, they're about nine or 10 millimeters. And the work that ours done, that's about the size they are when they hatch. So we had gotten them uh, pretty soon after they, they, they had emerged. In the near shore zone, they were getting bigger. In the offshore zone, they weren't getting bigger at all. They weren't, I don't think that they were actually shrinking. We were just sampling different populations as we moved around the lake. And this is work from uh, Otomari and, and our trying to put it into some context. And our growth rates were much smaller, or much lower than they found when they looked at uh, nearshore areas off the Keweenaw and also when they did lab studies. And so point, uh, our growth rate of 0.08 millimeters is really small. And it's, it suggests that they are probably growing fast enough to survive. But we won't know that until we sample a couple of months from now, because then we're going to pick up those one-year-olds. And those, that, the yellow line in the top left shows that, that point two, that, and that's what they observed off the Keweenaw when they did it in, uh, I think their samples were collected around 2005 uh, for that paper. And then on the, on the top right shows kind of a theoretical uh, plot of, of how we should have seen the warming occurring uh, in the nearshore and offshore zone. And like in the offshore zone, it's just so cold. And there's just so much variation too if you look at the, the nearshore samples from this for the same date, depending on where you were, how far you off how far the ship was offshore, you saw a wide range of temperatures. But it was very cold. And we're hypothesizing that it was probably too cold to get adequate growth for, for high survival. We don't want to be a downer because we're all hoping that since we we saw so many larvae that it, it's a good year. But again, we only have one sample. So is that 14 billion, is that a high number or is that a a low number, or is that they're always producing 14 billion? We just don't know yet. And so I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned that, but we're going to continue to do that sampling uh, each year so we can put those numbers in greater context. So for 2014, we had really high ice cover 
but very slow spring warming. And this is what it looked like on 25 March, so basically one day ago, a year ago. And this is what it looked like yesterday, or the 25th. And so we're, the ice is leaving much quicker. For the same uh, maximum concentration of ice, basically a 97% ice cover, there's much less right now. So we're going to see faster, uh, uh, faster warming in the spring. And so it'll give us not something to test. How is that going to affect Cisco recruitment? And so we'll be able to go out in May, June, and see if how many of those larvae made it to age one, which we, we can then index and put in context. And then we'll also collect the, the last fall's young of year, so we can put that in context with those 14 billion that we saw last year. And then we can compare their growth, and hopefully conditions will be a little bit warmer. So our immediate questions surrounding that project are, so what are the interannual differences in abundance, growth, and energy density of those lar larval core gonads? And are these uh, measures correlated with ice and spring and summer surface temperatures? We think that they are. We just want to be able to show that. And then can these measures, measures predict age one, age one survival? And then what is the optimal study design to balance spatial and temporal coverage? And I kind of alluded to that, is that it's, it's beautiful. We have beautiful spatial coverage, but we have very poor temporal coverage because we can't follow an individual population and see their growth rates at, at a particular site that's warming. Thank you.